favorite and beloved melody of some golden day break introduces another bright spot our gospel broadcaster Harold Seitler speaking and we kind of the real joy to be able to come with you every Lord's Day Channel 7 830 with this gospel uh, television period and we're trusting that the Holy Spirit shall help us to be a blessing I want that I have no other reason to come except to be a help to you in the Lord with the music and with the preaching of God's Word Sunday by Sunday as we come with the message I'll be speaking to you today on the church a body the church a body my text is in Ephesians chapter number five if you have your Bible you can look with me in a moment as I bring the message on the bright spot hour an unusual musical part of the telecast today an organ piano duet I appreciate uh, Mrs. Horn and Miss Raines as they play these instruments from week to week and they're going to play for you on these two lovely instruments does Jesus care song beloved by many of you does Jesus care and I'd love to dedicate that song to every elderly person watching the telecast today may the Lord bless you and every sick person in the hospital you know I have some members of the congregation at Tabernacle who are watching the telecast today from a hospital bed and may the Lord bless you and I mark you I remind you indeed the Lord Jesus does care and I'd like to say just a word about our Sunday school and the preaching hours at Tabernacle today we look forward eagerly to the Lord's day morning when we can assemble together for the Sunday School Hour. Uh, we're studying in the Proverbs uh, in the Sunday School at Tabernacle today in chapter number 20. Uh, seven. We invite you to bring your Bible, plan to meet us uh, for the Sunday School at Tabernacle today. 1045, the morning preaching hour is at 12 noon, and then again tonight at 730. Now the Lord willing, the pastor will be speaking in the 12 o'clock morning service as well as tonight at 730. And I begin a series in the morning services on last Sunday on the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. I spoke last Sunday on the church at Ephesus. I'm going to speak today on the letter to the church at Smyrna. The Lord willing, at the 12 o'clock preaching hour and then again tonight at 7.30 in the auditorium at Tabernacle. You have a welcome, my friend. We have ample parking, adequate parking to take care of many, many people. Last Sunday, 1,460 in the Sunday School at Tabernacle and the uh, hospitality of the people is yours. You will not find a more friendly and cordial, a more humble group of people uh, assembled together anywhere in the Greenville area that you'll enjoy at Tabernacle Baptist Church. Some old-fashioned singing always at Tabernacle down through the years we have emphasized congregational singing. We sing the old hymns of the church. We sometimes sing the new spiritual songs and then sometimes we sing the psalms as well. Our old-fashioned variety of church songs we sing at Tabernacle. No modern beat, no new song. We want, uh, that is the new type of gospel song. I don't appreciate
see that. And we don't have that at Tabernacle. But we're singing the old-fashioned standard hymns and spiritual songs that will lift you and inspire you in the Lord. And you'll enjoy the uh, fellowship of God's people around the Word of God in the preaching hours. Sunday School 1045. Plan to meet us today. A welcome is yours. Tabernacle Baptist Church, White Horse Road, Greenville, South Carolina, for the Sunday School and the preaching hours today. Brother Don Bright, one of our dear men at Tabernacle, a master with the saxophone, is going to play with the uh, organ and piano, a trio instrumental number that will bless your heart, I'm sure. Wonderful peace. Thank you, Don. That's beautiful. Uh, this brother lifts us in the Lord when he plays this instrument in the services of Tabernacle, and oftentimes Brother Horn will have him sing during the offertory or some other special time in the services, and our people enjoy uh, hearing the instruments with the saxophone and our brother Don Bright. May I say thank you, my friend, for watching the telecast today, and every Sunday at this very same time we're coming to your home by the grace of God, and it's all by faith. Uh, we believe this to be the word of God, that we tell the story and preach the good news into the highways and hedges, and this is made possible only by friends as you are who are willing to stand by and who do stand by by writing and by making your part and having your part uh, in the continuation of this work of faith and labor of love. And the Bright Spot Hour is that and has been that since the programs were born back in 1943 and continuously since 1943 we've been telling the story by radio and by television that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. I have three brand new sermon cassette tapes that I'd love to offer to my Bright Spot Hour family today for the very first time on the TV. Uh, sermon number one, The Romance of Redemption, the story of Ruth. Uh, an unusual sermon. Every time I have the opportunity to preach about Ruth, I thrill within my heart. One of the greatest types of the gospel indeed I've ever seen in all the Bible is the book of Ruth uh, setting forth the truth of the gospel way back as a golden nugget in the Old Testament. 
Mr. McKinnon. Then cassette number two is the fall of Adam. Why? Why did Adam take the forbidden fruit? Now, I mark you that the first man, Adam, is a type of the second man, Adam, who is my Lord Jesus Christ. In Adam, we die. But in the second man, Adam, we're made alive by redemption and by the grace of God. The fall of Adam. Why did Adam take that forbidden fruit? Somebody said, well, he just could not withstand the temptation. But actually, that isn't correct. No. Uh, somebody will say, well, he didn't know any better. Oh, that's not correct either. Uh, Adam could have said no. Adam could have refused to have eaten that forbidden fruit. But he voluntarily, you mark that now, he voluntarily became numbered with his bride in her fall that he might redeem her from the curse of sin. Now that's exactly what our Savior did. He voluntarily left the glory of heaven and came down into this earth and suffered and bled and died that he might redeem me and you from the ruin of sin sin. The fall of Adam, cassette number two. Why did Adam take that forbidden fruit? Then number three, John's baptism. The baptism of John the baptizer. The text is in Acts chapter number 18. What about John's baptism? What is John's baptism? What's the difference between John's baptism and the baptism of the Great Commission in Matthew 28? Now I deal with those things. In fact, I brought this message to our people here at Tabernacle and we have now reproduced it exactly as I delivered it from the pulpit and it's available. I'll be happy to mail a copy of the cassette into your home. Now I'm sending all three of these cassettes at one time into any home where the Bright Spot Hour now may go for your gift of $10 in support of this work. I don't know where you could find three sermons more important than these three. The Romance of Redemption, the Story of Ruth, the Fall of Adam, Why, and number three, John's Baptism. All three of them basically essential and they'll warm your heart and lift you in the Lord and it would thrill me to be able to send all three of them in one package to you at one time and we're prepared to do that if you'll write to me and simply ask for the three cassettes that are offered on the telecast. That's all you need call for. Mail to me the three cassettes that you offered on the tele TV. I know exactly which three to include and it should be my joy and my privilege to do so. My mailing address is the Bright Spot Hour and post office box number four. Greenville, South Carolina, 29602. I'm counting upon you, my friend, to stand faithfully by. With your Bible open now to Ephesians chapter number 5, I want to speak to you today on the church of body. On the last two Sundays, I spent dealing with the subject, the church, an agency. And I tried to point out to you that the church uh, is an agency of fellowship. The church is an agency of missions. The church is an agency of evangelism. The church is an agency for recruiting workers uh, into the work of the gospel. The church is an agency of spiritual growth. And then I point out to, point out to you also that the church is an agency uh, through which we give our tithe into the gospel around the world. The church, indeed, an agency. And all these things that I said about the church being an agency, you'll not find in any other organization in all the the world as you'll find it in the local church. For example, no organization in the world could ever provide for you the Christian fellowship that a local church can provide. I'm of the uh, opinion that one of the reasons my Heavenly Father saw fit to establish the church upon the earth is to provide that kind of fellowship for you and me, pilgrims and sojourners and strangers in a foreign land in need of that kind of fellowship that we can find only and enjoy only in a local congregation of born again and baptized believers. Now the same thing I could say about all the other things that I mentioned in relation to the church and agency. But you know the church is more than that. I'd like to remind you today and speak to you from the uh, fact that the church is a body. Note that now. The church a body. Very definitely so. And the analogy is set up in the scriptures. It's not my own idea. When I say the church is a body, that isn't my own theological uh, fancy or my own idea, but I read it out of the Bible. Now with your Bible open to Ephesians chapter number 5, uh, let me note a few verses with you. Beginning with verse number 18 where I'm exhorted, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but 
be filled with the Spirit. Now you not argue that now, clear command in verse number 18. No believer, no born again believer would ever dare become drunken on wine. You and I are saved from that and delivered from that. We'd never uh, do that. But we are exhorted to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the great need of all believers is right at that particular point that we be filled with the Spirit. Now I want you to watch a threefold result of having been filled with the Spirit of God in verses 19, 20, and 21. Number one, when a man is filled with the Spirit of God, he speaks one to another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts unto the Lord. In, in other words, I'm saying that a Spirit-filled believer is a happy believer, a singing believer. And when a man is filled with the Spirit of God, he's absolutely content with the Lord, and he'd rather be indeed an old-time Christian than anything in the world. I can give that testimony to you today. I think sometimes people feel sorry for me a little bit having given 40 years to the ministry, you know, and having not become wealthy or famous, not having the opportunity to be in business and make a lot of money. Sometimes folks say, well, I kind of feel sorry for you, preacher. All these years you've given yourself as an humble Baptist preacher with not much of this world's goods. My friend, I wouldn't have it any other way. I'd rather be a Baptist preacher than to be the president of these United States of America. No greater joy I could ever hope to enjoy than that which I have enjoyed in these 40 years in the ministry. And I can truthfully say to you that I'm happy in the Lord. Amen. And every spirit-filled believer is happy in the Lord, and they speak one to another, not with words of contention and strife and anger and malice. When you find a person that's difficult to get along with, you can put it down, that person is not spirit-filled. When you find a person that's easily offended with words, that person is not spirit-filled. When you find a person that speaks hard words, unkind words, uncharitable words, you can put it down. That person is not spirit-filled. A spirit-filled believer speaks one to another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in their heart unto the Lord. Note the three types of singing that we're to engage in in our local churches. We're to sing the psalms in the Bible. We're to sing the standard hymns of the church. And then third, we're to sing the spiritual songs like love lifted me and he lives. Those are spiritual songs, you see. And we're to sing those as well as the standard hymns and as well as the psalms that we find in the Bible. Then the second result of being filled with the Spirit is in verse 20, giving thanks always for all things under our God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Second, a Spirit-filled believer is a thankful believer. You thank God for your health. You thank God for your wealth. You thank God for your home. You thank God for your clothing. You thank God for your automobile. You thank God for your wife and children. You thank God for your friends. You thank God for your church. You thank God for your country. You thank God for the food you consume. Spirit filled believers are thankful. They give God praise and thanksgiving for everything. You take a man filled with the Spirit of God, it doesn't take a great deal to satisfy that man because he's, he, he's prompted and he's bent in the direction of being thankful for the very least of the blessings of God upon his life. Then number three, uh, the third evidence of being filled with the Spirit of God is in verse 21. Spirit anointed people submit themselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. In other words, they delight in harmony and peace and fellowship. Uh, they grieve when there's discord and a lack of fellowship and a lack of harmony. A spirit anointed believer will submit himself one to another in the fear of the Lord. Then in verse 22, Paul goes on to say, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife. Now, that doesn't sound like the newspapers are nowadays, does it? That doesn't sound like the ERA either, does it? That doesn't sound like Washington in our day. But the Bible says, uh, for the husband is the head of the wife. Now, note, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Now, I want you to note that in that verse, the analogy is set up between the church and and the body. Now that's not my uh, analogy, but this is divinely inspired of God. Je Jesus is the head of the church. 
and he is the Savior of the body, which is the church. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be subject to their own husbands in everything. Now, husbands, love your wives. That's right. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of water, by the word of God, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy, that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies, that he that uh, loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but instead a man that's rational and reasonable and sane will nourish and cherish his own flesh, therefore will love and cherish his own wife. Even as the Lord loves and nourishes and cherishes the church. Now there you have it. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bone. Now there you have it. For we, born again, we that give testimony to the grace of God, are members of his body. We are members of his flesh. We are members of his bones. And there it is, clearly, in the word of God. Uh, for this cause shall a man uh, uh, leave father and mother, and be joined unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. Now this is a great mystery, verse 32. But, Paul said, I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now there is the analogy set up very clearly in the Holy Scriptures that the church is called a body and the church is similar to a body and the illustration is very clear in the Holy Scriptures. And upon that basis, I therefore I speak to you on the church a body. Now, in what way is the church a body? First of all, I'd remind you that the body of the church is complete in conception. Second, miraculous in the new birth. Third, members in particular. Fourth, endowed in ability. Number five, perfected by the word of God. And number six, kept by his power. And number seven, complete in eternity. Now, give me a moment with each of these seven tremendous things that I say in relation to the church, a body. Number one, complete in conception. Now, I want you to hear me for a moment, please. This is very important. I'd like to remind you that the church, that you and me that are saved a part of, in the mind of God was conceived before the foundation of the world. I sometimes think people have the idea that the church is a salvage program and a second best. That God was so disappointed when Israel rejected the Messiah and crucified the Prince of Glory until he picked up the broken pieces at Calvary and formed or made for himself a substitute, a second best, that he called the church. Now, my soul, if you have that idea about the church, you are as wrong as you can be. I'd like to remind you that the church is not an afterthought. The church is not a salvage program. The church is not a second best. I think I'm bold to say and correct to say that God loves the church. My Heavenly Father loves the church as much as he's wedded and loves Israel, his covenant people. Now, that's not to discount Israel. That's not to cast any reflection upon God's elect people and God's chosen people, never. But I'm simply saying to you that in God's mind, God foreknew the church from the foundation of the world. And the church as we have it in our day is not a salvage program, but God's eternal purpose and plan from the foundation of the world. Don't you ever forget that. There was a time when I was not. I stand before you now. You see me on the TV. Next month, if I live for another month, I'll be 64 years old. But there was a time when I did not exist. My mother and dad came together in holy matrimony back in 1913. Back in 1913. Sometimes after they were wedded together in matrimony, my father, my dad knew my mother. And that moment, God said, live. And that moment, God sparked the gene of my wife, my, my father, and the gene of my mother. God, uh, as they fused together, God sparked them with life. God said, live. And that moment, I was conceived. Now, had you seen me, you know, you listen closely to me. Had you seen me then, you would have never recognized me. 
You could not have even seen me at the moment of my conception, except you had a microscope and a powerful microscope at that. But had you been able to look at me under the microscope, you probably would have never known uh, anything about me at that moment. You could not have discerned anything about me at that particular moment. But at the moment of my conception, the shape of my body, the size of my body, the shape of my hands, uh, my mental intellect, my IQ, the color of my eyes, the color of my skin, the complexion of my skin, the color of my hair, everything about me was predetermined. Not when I was born, as I said a moment ago, May the 15th, 1914, but at the moment of my conception, that moment I was right then, everything that I am right now. And the reason I'm everything that I am right now is because I was all of that in the moment of my conception. My father passed away two years ago, all his lifetime until late in life had black hair. I mean jet black hair. My mother, we have pictures of my mother when she was young, likewise had black hair, jet black hair. I'm their firstborn child. My mother and dad had five children, all of us live, and I'm the first of the five. And here I come on the scene with red hair. And I'm sure that my mother and daddy probably were perplexed. Uh, my dad might have looked at me and said to my mother, he doesn't look a bit like you. And my mother might have looked at me as a baby and said to my dad, he doesn't look a bit like you either. And the fact of the matter is, as far as my complexion is concerned and the color of my hair is concerned, they were right. But had you ever seen my granddad, my granddaddy Seitler, you would have known where I've got my complexion. You would have known where I got my red hair because he had both, you see, exactly as I have it. But that was, con uh, that was uh, predetermined at my conception. That's what I'm trying to say to you, that I, in my conception, was a complete body. I have 10 fingers today. I had them at the very moment of my conception. I had two eyes, I have two eyes today. I had them at the moment of my conception. I had two legs, I have two legs today and 10 toes. I had them at the moment of my conception. Everything that I now have, I had at the moment of my conception. Now if the Holy Scriptures is correct, in setting up the analogy between a body and the church, then I think I'm correct in saying to you that the church is a body complete in conception from the foundation of the world. God foreknows and foreordains everything the church has ever been or ever shall be. Now that consoles my heart and encourages my soul. The old devil sometimes tells me that he's going to win out. He shall destroy the church. The old devil tells me that it shall grind to a halt someday and going to become defeated by his might. But the devil is a liar. There's not a thing in the world the devil can do but stand by and watch God do what he has foreordained to do from the foundation of the world. And I have confidence that God is able to bring it to pass. So the church, a body complete in conception. Now I'd like to continue this general thought on next Lord's Day, the Lord willing. Thank you for watching. God bless you all and goodbye.